This episode, I'm joined by Robert Rodriguez to discuss his book, The Book of Hermits, a history of hermits from antiquity to the present, alongside discussions on seclusion, introversion, and his work at Hermitary. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paying patrons and subscribers for making all this work possible. And if you'd like to support the podcast and keep it going as it runs off patronage alone, then please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Robert Rodriguez, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. Um, so, it's uh, sort of apt in a way. I mean, it's getting near near to interview 200 now and uh, have yet to actually do a episode on uh, hermits or hermeticism, uh, despite, you know, the name being Hermetics, which is tangentially related to, to hermits. Oh. So... We are going to be discussing your book, uh, The Book of Hermits, A History of Hermits from Antiquity to the Present, um, which, as people would imagine, is a a full history of hermits and what that means and how it's developed and and, uh, all the different different hermits, which some people would know and some people wouldn't. And it's um, an extremely readable, enjoyable book and, uh, yeah, so before we just jump in, I guess, into the depths of Hermits, uh, yeah, just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what it is you do and how you came to write this book. Sure. Well, my interest in, in the university was history. And when I completed that degree, after a few years, I went in, in pursuit of a, a professional degree for librarianship. And then uh, I spent the next 40 years as a librarian. I just recently retired mostly in universities and colleges. And along the way, I had a number of history interests, and one of those was hermits. But uh, my interest was especially peaked in 1993 with the book of um, of Bill Porter, uh, which uh, addressed hermits in China and, and contemporary ones, not just historical. And that was kind of a revelation because I had always thought of hermits in terms of the Western world, desert hermits and so forth. Mm. So that prompted me to pursue a lot of reading. And uh, around the year 2000, when the Internet was starting to take off, I noticed there wasn't much about hermits. So I thought, well, maybe I'll try to do something. And that's where Hermitary came about. Mm -hmm. And that's been 20 years of Hermitary, 20 plus. (laughs) And then the the book is just, as you said, a, a pretty much a compilation of all that content, and is ongoing because I try to keep up on that. Mm. You're always finding new hermits. Yes, yeah, so it's it's another world, as it were, than the historical world, but uh, it's it's still the common uh, mm. impulse of of certain people to to follow that uh, project, so to speak. Mm, mm. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm sure you know your your work with Hermitary will will come up, but I'm excited to ask you in a way the the Hermetics question before we you know really launch into this discussion about hermits. You can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listening on the conversation. Who do you pick? And I notice there I've put the word thinker in there, but they don't. You know, they could really be anyone if you wanted to. Oh sure. Well, actually, I don't think hermits would do well in conversation. <laughs> But um, what I look for in, in when I'm reading mostly classic text or anything modern, too, I'm looking for for where there's some relationship to solitude, because solitude has become, in effect, the, the modern version, uh, not quite the same at all, but pretty close. Um so I, I like um, uh, three thinkers might be uh, Montaigne, um, Thoreau, and uh, Simone Weil. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All of them are addressing to one degree the, the subject of solitude. Not exclusively, of course, but uh, there's also the element of a lived experience, which I appreciate. Uh, so it's not just theory, it's not just uh, conjecture, but each of those three had uh, circumstances like Montaigne 
uh, living in the world, uh, addressing political and civic issues, and at the same time, as he says, keeping a little back shop in his uh, mind where he could retreat, as it were. Mm. Um, Thoreau is very obvious because he actually decided to try it out, mm -hmm. uh, which was unusual in in the historical sense because uh, he didn't cut off all of his ties to society and eventually returned to society. And in general, he was uh, living within society. Uh, I, I like his... Um, description of his hut where he has three chairs, one for solitude, two for friendship, and the third one for society. <laughs> um, and Simone Weil is, is I, not exhausted of her reading her work, but she's a very modern application of some of those principles, which is interesting. Um, and she addresses them tangentially, but also a couple of essays that speak directly of, of solitude. So I think they would have an interesting conversation if the three of them were in one room, because they have different eras in which they live, but at the same time, um, they would find a lot in common. Mm. So sort of three almost semi-hermits, people who've at least sculpted or carved out an understanding of what it is to to find solitude and to find that idea of you know going off finding your own solitude but uh you haven't necessarily become strictly a hermit so you can at least still have this sort of conversation about things you're right and and in the modern world it's it's pretty hard to imitate anything that that happened historically mm -hmm. i mean it's almost impossible to be the equivalent um, but there are people in the rest of the world, uh, outside the Western world, who, in effect, society sanctions their eremitism. Mm. Well, in the Western world, it's always been looked upon as a, a, a kind of psychological aberration. <laughs> yeah, gone are the days of um, walking off into the desert and getting alms from the the local village or something like that in the West. Why do, why do you why do you think it is that the West we find it perhaps so abhorrent to undertake the the life of a hermit? I think the the probably the culture of the West uh, was always paralleling political and and religious or spiritual interests. So. Uh, while there's no Aramidism in, uh, in uh, Hebrew thought, pretty much not, um, or Islamic, but in Christianity, it's emerging at a time when the Roman Empire is in effect defining how institutions are going to function, which is to say, the, in, in the case of Rome, there's really no exception to centralize authority. And in Christianity, the hermits were kind of uh, uh, rebellious. Uh, they were uh, not interested in the primary thrust of, of the contemporary church, which kind of um, emblematic would be somebody like Athanasius, mm -hmm. uh, is primarily a heresy fighter or a heresy hunter, if we will. And it's not a, his biography of Anthony, even though Anthony is supposed to be the founding hermit in Christianity, is primarily fighting demons and not really looking at what, what we might call psychological or, or humane issues with solitude. And I think that affected uh, much of the thinking of of the church with regard to hermitism later as well. There was always a tension between is the hermit spiritual and therefore a safe commodity, or is he some kind of secret heretic or somehow overthrowing 
or undermining authority. Uh, that, that tension always existed in the Middle Ages, and by the time modern time, well, there's uh, the hermit has basically disappeared because there's no uh, dominant uh, sense of, of spirituality among all the institutions of the day. Hmm. I guess when you put it like that, it's clear that it's, I guess it is a rebellion of a sort, but it's a rebellion as seen from the position of society. So it's the ultimate statement of there's really nothing you can offer me. You know, it's not some sort of uh, punk rebellion where you just form a new identity. You're stating like there's nothing you can, there's nothing you can offer me offer me to sort of win me over or to bring me back which is a sort of the most frustrating form of rebellion for society because it, what do you exact what do you do with someone who uh doesn't need anything <laughs> right right um one of the the popular uh expressions in i think it's the first letter of john is uh love god and do what you wish or what you please and understood in that pure spiritual sense, uh, the hermits seem to adapt that in the sense that they are not, they're, they're given a certain theology, let's say, but they're not interested in disputing the details. They're not interested in engaging with heretics and uh, so-called. And later that phrase takes on a, a almost institutional sense. Like, uh, I think Augustine quotes that, but when he quotes it, he says, um, that's why a father can beat his son when he is disobedient, because he loves God, and part of, of uh, what he needs to do is to correct his son's behavior, and he's doing it for the love of God. Well, there's a tension there if if that becomes uh, a, a saying or a dictum of of institutions, because then they can punish with without any particular um, break or or uh, context. While the hermits are, uh, in a sense, are going out to the desert, their love of God is so thorough that. They, as you said, they don't need anything anymore. And they're not going to go off and, and do anything that violates that love of God. So what they do is what they please, in quotes, but it's not, uh, it's not threatening or, or heretical in that broader sense. It's just that, like Thomas Merton said, um, they were just pretty far away from the bishops, and that was fine for them. That's funny. Yeah. What, so, I mean, I guess it's almost perhaps a too obvious a question, but I think one thing your book does emphasize fairly early on is a hermit is almost built from the negative of what isn't a hermit. So often it seems, especially in the West, probably from that sort of animosity that, that the West has for, or well, modern West has for hermits, is is that a lot of people or a lot of undertakings are called hermeticism or people are called a hermit when perhaps you yourself wouldn't define them as one. It seems that you have quite a, a it's somewhat broad, but, but it is, there is specifics as to what is a hermit. So there's certain famous hermits or known hermits that I, you know, I know you mentioned in your book um i know you know we've mentioned thoreau but am i right in thinking that actually you don't necessarily consider thoreau a, her a, a hermit exactly right right and it, it's almost uh impossible to be a hermit today and 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 still want to carry on um uh, an awareness of of what's going on in society or politics or uh, intellectual activity, which Thoreau certainly did, uh, and it was in a sense a kind of retreat rather than a, a, something that was intended to be short term. Uh, 
then there's that overlap with uh, people like um, I'm, I'm thinking again of New England here. Um, somebody like M Emily Dickinson, mm. who was uh, more of a recluse in the sense that she wanted to avoid people. It was not a project as such. I, I, I tend to think of the hermit as, um, to use the standard dictionary definition, a hermit is a, a solitary person who is inspired or uh, motivated by a religious motive. Hmm. And that can be broadened. Uh, to say philosophical or spiritual or or even a, a ethical uh, but in 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 any case um, even when we broaden that definition uh, we're not going to find somebody who is in in the desert or gone to a mountain or something like that Eastern, uh, tradition, Asian tradition is a lot more explicit in that sense. There's a lot more fluidity. There's a lot more opportunity in effect to, to express that hermitism in a, a almost, I guess you could say almost a pristine way, uh, which just doesn't exist in the West, which is one of the reasons why I like, uh, Bill Porter's book was was what got me started <laughs> in uh, looking at Eastern versions of Aramidism. Mm -hmm. So I think you also mentioned that the, the one of the soon, well, quickly becoming more famous um, books on a, a now known hermit, the North Pond Hermit, is sort of emphatically not what a hermit is because uh, you know it's just that notion of being a recluse, not wanting to deal with people. So for you, uh, a, a hermit by definition, there's, there is a, a larger project, a larger reason, be it spiritual, philosophical. There's something which is being worked out from that solitude right. that, that, that can only be worked out from solitude. It can only be found in solitude, perhaps. Right. And, and that would distinguish a hermit from the recluse, let's say, who... Often it's a personality or psychological type um, that isn't going to really change with the circumstances. They're just going to be that way uh, no matter what their context. But um, in the Eastern world, uh, the best contrast is the, um, the... It's often called reclusion just because they're not officially hermits, but in ancient China, uh, anyone, any male who, um, who was literate, who could write, um, would be eligible for employment in, in, the, uh, in, in the imperial court. And so a lot of intelligent um, people did go there, but when they observed the, the degree of corruption in the court, um, they had no alternative to, to think that they were going to try to reform anything. So hmm. a lot of them would simply quit. They would leave. They would recluse. Hmm. Uh, many of them uh, wrote thereafter. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, the most famous might be someone like uh, Du Fu, who lived in the 700s in the Tang Dynasty, uh, had been an official all of his life, had been sent to every corner of China, partly to do accounting for, for military ventures and so forth. But always he longed to, to quit because he saw the whole thing as corrupt. And when he finally did, he, he um, simply left for the mountains with with his family so there there's an example where he had not lived in solitude in the court certainly but he also had a family mm. even though he, he uh, lived in the in the mountains 
he wrote a lot of poetry and a number of of figures like that in the tradition of china because it was in effect different um origins as it were the origin story of the western world tends to be the greco-roman uh structures the uh in in china the confucian um model was a a good example the confucius spent his whole life going from province to province trying to convince the lords of each province to lead an ethical life to have certain guidelines for their how they treated everyone and everyone thought that well confucius himself pretty much realized that it was futile he could not convince anyone Mm -hmm. Um, and one example, he was uh, he was going to a distant province in his carriage, and the attendant was leading him, and he got lost. So he asked uh, his attendant to stop and ask ask those two men that are working in the field for directions. So he went out and he, he said, you know, I'm the attendant of Confucius and we're trying to find the way to such and such province. And one of the men uh, looked at him and said, oh, well then your master uh, doesn't know the difference between one grain and another, by which he meant the real substance of life. You know, the difference between, say, barley and millet so that you can survive. You don't know anything about these things, and yet you're going around telling people what to do, in effect. And he said, instead of going about trying to reform society, you should be withdrawing from society and and following those simple principles um, based on nature in, in this case. And when the attendant returned to the carriage and informed Confucius what what the man had said, Confucius said, oh, yes, those are hermits. <laughs> and, and that's so persuasive in the sense that there isn't going to be any other path uh, except collaboration and work with the imperial court. Every province, every uh, governor, everyone was pretty much dependent on that. So the alternative was to simply have a piece of land on your own somewhere, whether you had a family or whether you were sufficiently inspired to 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 be on your own as a, a mountain hermit. But in ancient China, there's no real uh, dominant uh religion in the sense uh, of the western world so there's no need to to in effect have the project be a religious one so it's more of a philosophical or even social or uh or natural personal project mm-hmm. but this that's repeated over and over in china Do you think that's one of the key differences, perhaps, if there is such a thing between Eastern and Western hermits, then, is that Eastern hermits are doing so in a reaction, and Western Westerners perhaps still have that sort of, uh, you know, idea of the frontier, the individual, I'm going to go sort of plant my hermit flag as opposed to a reaction. There's a sort of a difference in temp- temperament. Yeah I, I, yeah, I think maybe the the, the Western um, expression of Eremitism um, succeeds most when it it's similar to the motive of Chinese, even if the um, the element of the love of God is not the same in in the case of China, but there's some 
equivalent as far as motivation that is still positive. Um, when the desert hermits and the Christian desert hermits um, begin to form, as it were, uh, or increase in numbers, uh, it's really a response to uh, the increasing centralization of the empire. And especially when the empire becomes Christian, um, some of the her hermits would say that they were, if if it had been a hundred years before, they were fleeing the world. Mm -hmm. But now they're fleeing the church that is in the world, mm -hmm. having become part of the empire. So they were looking for something that would be motivated by love of God. And in that sense, it's very similar to the response of the the Chinese hermits that they aren't going to find anything in the world in quotes. So they'll they'll go to where the world does not pursue them, the the red dust of the world, so to speak. Um, uh, good examples of that, I would say, is um, the story of Paul of Thebes that was pretty much uh, composed by St. Jerome, uh, even though for a long time it wasn't known. <laughs> um, but when Anthony goes out from, from Alexandria to the desert, because... Um, well, the anecdote with Anthony is that he was still a young man and an orphan with his sister, and the money they had collected, she was taking care of, but her fiancé stole all of it, and so the two of them were bereft of anything. Um, and he, he was uh, reflecting on that when he happened to walk by a church, and a sermon was being presented, and so he stepped inside. And the sermon was, of course, the uh, familiar statement of Jesus saying, if you want to be perfect, give everything you have, give it up, and follow me. So Anthony thought, well, I know how I can do that. I'll become a hermit. So he goes uh, to visit Paul of Thebes, and like I said, it's a story from Jerome, which reflects Jerome's own kind of uh, push and pull. But when he goes to Paul, uh, Paul greets Anthony and, and says to him, "Well, how are things in the in the world? How fares the the human race? Uh, what new empires have risen?" Uh, and uh, do does anybody has anybody survived this um, this uh, wave of errors of of uh, of the era of the era? Um, well, he he's basically saying, you know, I'm not in the world anymore. So I'm just kind of curious, you who come out of the world, what's how's things going? Anything different? Uh, and this is like a, a sentiment that that any uh, hermit in any era would be able to say. They, 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 it's not that they're necessarily disinterested or hostile towards people, um, but instead they're they're just seeing that that the world as it's conceived is not going to be of benefit to them. Do you think it's possible to be a secular hermit, a hermit that doesn't believe? I think if there's an equivalent motive, um, and and the sense that, um, well, especially today, with with so many primary sources to to uh, understand the history of hermits, and to understand a kind of universality even among the most uh, religiously motivated, there's still something, a core of something that, that can appeal to anyone. Um, 
and I think it's also a a, a view of uh, of how one configures the world. Um, I think uh, the, you know, there's a, the Japanese um, essayist from the 11th hundreds or 12th century. His name was um, Kamu no Chomai. Um, he tells us um, in the little book he wrote, um, which actually the book is intended to describe his hut in the mountains, but that's at the end of the story. What happens was that he lived in Tokyo and there was a, a period of, of natural disasters, really. Um, uh, storms, floods, earthquake, fire, uh, famine because of the destruction and flooding. Uh, and he sees all of that. And he he says, um, you know, all, all the, the rivers flow on um, regardless. Um, the water is... is um, is constantly changing the bubbles and the river um, just disappear. They reappear, uh, but in the end, it's every everything ends this way. So he's he's observing the uh, impermanence of the world of of society of all the things that people find valuable that they can disappear in in a moment, and in fact, one should recognize that and therefore not uh, attach oneself to them or to the world. Um, an ethical kind of view, but also a, a psychological one that is complemented by hermetism. Um, and that line that he uses to describe the, the, the river flows on unceasingly, always different, never the same. It kind of reminds me of um, Heraclitus, mm. the Socratic Greek philosopher, who said almost almost line by line the same thing. Uh, what they're observing then, in, in the case of uh, the Japanese essayist, he's observing uh, impermanence that is at the heart of... of um, of Buddhism, and so he becomes, because he was not at the time, he becomes a Buddhist monk mm. and goes off to the mountains to make a little hut and to live there. And he only sees other hermits. They'll greet one another, they'll sit and chat about this and that, and then they move on or move back to where they were. So perhaps in abstract, what we're seeing is um, uh, an understanding from, I guess, for the for the Chinese, for the empire, for Westerners, it'd be, you know, civilization writ large. What we're seeing is an understanding of or a move from the falsity of permanence to an acceptance of impermanence. And do you think, you know, it's often the case, and it was, I know, with... Um, names completely skip me the desert hermit that we were talking about earlier that other people would go out and seek this hermit and it's quite quite well known that people go out and seek hermits but do you think this is what they're uh, that they're, they're truly seeking is um some understanding some way to sort of spiritually grow or move forward oh yeah uh, that would probably be the heart of it because a lot of um we were talking about Anthony, who mm -hmm. was, uh, he just attracted a lot of people to, they would go out and he would, in effect, have to say, okay, you're going to live over here and you're going to go this way. Um, lots of the structure of the, the hermits, even when there were many of them in one place, was to... Uh, build a hut that they might call a cell and maybe not be within visual range of, of their neighbor 
or maybe so, it wouldn't matter. Um, and then their habit was to uh, come together on a Sunday for their liturgy and also to check the well-being of one another. And that was, uh, a, there, of course, it was land and no particular issue with property. So that was, that was how hundreds of hermits ended up in the in the, in that region of you know, Egypt and Syria and uh, Palestine and so forth. Are um, are all hermits? I guess in the modern tongue, we would say psychologically the same. Are they all introverted? Well, it, it's interesting. Probably personality type would be introverted in the sense um, that they don't have something to say to to just anyone. A, a good example is, um, uh, I think it was Bessarion or maybe someone else. Um, he um, was, had become a famous hermit and... and uh, and a, a scholar or, or a bishop or someone came to visit him to see him, to listen to him, to have him talk. And instead he was silent and and remained that way. And then finally his visitor uh, probably gave, gave him a, a, a look and uh, and he said, may I ask, not the visitor, the hermit asked, may I ask one thing of you and and the visitor said sure and he said if you could don't ever come back here because if you you come everyone will have to come and i'm going to have to leave my hut and go <laughs> somewhere else so it was rather blunt uh, another example that i like is um, a hermit called moses uh, he happened to be out in the, on the crossroads somewhere, taking a walk, I guess, wandering. And he saw a big troop of, of uh, tourists, so to speak, uh, come walking and slogging him down and saying, well, we're looking for Moses, the famous permit Moses. And Moses himself says, well, why do you want to see that old fool? <laughs> and they and they said, um, but but we must see him. We we heard a lot about him. We want to see him. And so Moses says, Oh well, um, you want to know where he lives um, in that direction. So he points, I don't know, points north or whatever. And off goes this big troop of people. But in fact, Moses lived in the opposite direction. <laughs> So that that is a, a sense of where um, they're not socially craven or, or um, reclusive or wanting to escape people, but actually just wanting to assert their own solitude and the integrity of their own uh, life. Mm -hmm. It reminds me, I think it's an Eastern story that someone told me once of a hermit who uh, every day he'd go for this this same sort of route walk that he'd do. And one day someone someone came along and asked if they could join him. And they did the they did the walk together, both in silence. And he said he when they got back, the man said, Do you mind if I bring my my friend tomorrow? And he said, Okay, sure. And then the friend came the next day. So there's the three of them walking around. And as they got about halfway where they could see the sunrise coming up, the friend said, look at that beautiful sunrise. And then that's all that was said. And then uh, as they got back, they stopped. And the hermit said to the original guy, he said, don't bring your friend next time. He talks too much. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds typical. Yeah. Mm. And then um, I think... If the motive is a spiritual, religious one like theirs, or philosophical even, um, it's probably going to be easier to to eliminate uh, the world, as it were. Um, in uh, in that biography of Anthony, 
uh, Athanasius, who is the, as I mentioned, the, the heresy fighter, he just spends all his time talking about Anthony fighting demons, all <laughs> kinds of demons. Mm -hmm. And sort of shows that Anth Athanasia didn't get the point of, of Eremitism. Um, but a lot of the motive of uh, worldly people may be, uh, like I mentioned with uh, Kamono Chomai, that there's just so many disasters in, in life that they want to uh, change themselves at least, even if they cannot change the world. Um, there's a, a French poet that I, I quote in the book from the 1400s, and those were awful days between plague and the uh, wars of religion and of uh, political fighting and economic changes and poverty and so forth that he he writes something like, um, if the times remain this way, I shall become a hermit because I don't see anything but grief and torment. Um, that's equivalent to maybe looking at the empire, of whether it's in uh, China or whether it's in uh, under Christian Rome, but the sense that there's a futility to pursuing uh, not only the institutional things, but to suffering the the, the plagues of the of the day. Uh, mm -hmm. Not um, not so much a modern motive, I guess, because there isn't anywhere to go, as it were. Then <laughs> mm -hmm. there there hermits are. Um, were never really promoted in the West. Um, uh, St. Benedict didn't, when he founded his um, monastic orders, he was especially uh, skeptical about uh, people who would be hermits. Um, he considered them uh, potential um, thieves or, or wandering marauders who were robbers on the highways or something of that sort. So he was very uncomfortable with he, even the idea of Eremitism. Uh, by that point, they were, the institutions were not going to accommodate anything like um, what what was going on in the desert or what had, had transpired in the desert. And the stories were coming to the West uh, John Cassian is one of those who goes to the East or to Egypt and so forth and records all of these uh, sayings and anecdotes and so forth and brings them back to the West. But the roadblock there is that there's no place for hermits who are going to be suspected to be um, frauds or, or heretics, there's no place for them. And and even St. Benedict doesn't want much to do with them. So a lot of what ends up uh, in the Western world is that um, there'll be circles of hermits, but they're outside of the, the range of um, viability in society. Um, in in the UK, especially, um, a lot of uh, women who were interested in in Eremitism were uh, put in uh, anchor holds, as they were called, mm -hmm. and not only shut off from the world, which is what they kind of wanted, but they were shut off from even uh, the spiritual comforts that would have come from from that life. So it, it was downgraded, if we want to use that term. It's interesting that you, you mentioned the anchorites, because I think of um, St. Julian of Norwich, most famously, it's very near to me. Um, 
in another discussion that I had with Paul Kingsnorth, he mentions how, you know, in St. Julian's Day, to be an anchorite wouldn't have been looked upon as we look upon it now. You know, probably be people, if they were explained how she lived her life, there'd be gasps of, you know, horror or mm-hmm. befuddlement. But in her day, it would have been understood, as you said there, that uh, as, as a perfectly reasonable way to live. And it, it, it makes me wonder, you know, you've mentioned that, I guess, systematically, politically, and also sort of structurally in the West now, it's extremely difficult to be a hermit. But do you think um, perhaps something has been lost psychologically where we, we, we've lost actually what the understanding of that is? And so even if, uh, you know, some miraculous desert or cave system was to open in the UK, there, there wouldn't really be the understanding of why you do that all, uh, at all. Right, that that pretty much has been lost. And uh, to kind of try to recreate it would might seem artificial. Um, and and the spontaneity almost to to pursue that almost has to be um, a conjunction of of different elements. Like in uh, in the Low Countries in uh, Belgium. The Netherlands in uh, in the 14, 1500s, uh, a lot of women who wanted to be to pursue a religious life uh, did not want to go to a convent. So there wasn't much of an alternative. But the wealthier women uh, figured out that they they could purchase uh, buildings, housing and invite poor poor women to uh, to live there, give them labor because the textile industry was starting to take off. Uh, and they could be independent and at, uh, pursue a life of, of both spiritual and practical and independent, again, of, of the institutions. Uh, those were the Beguines, they were called. Uh, and it wasn't, you could see that it wasn't going to, to last. It, it did go through much of, of uh, or half a century, three quarters of a century in the late 14, early 1500s. But that, that's a, another form of, uh, of Eremitism where uh, people with a common interest would define how they intend to live how they intend to to labor and support themselves and at the same time uh, live in the world, in effect. Uh, I suppose nowadays one could possibly speak of uh, intentional communities that might want to do something like that, Uh, but it's so hard to find people to do that. But... um, the model of um, uh, Stephen uh, Minute, I think his name was Minute, in France, was to create a system that mimicked the uh, the desert hermits, which was to put cells in where individual men could live and have them close uh, to one another so that they. Could would be this kind of mutual support or mutual aid. And at the same time, everyone would, would live in an aromatic life. It's just, it's hard to sustain, I suppose, but it would be harder in the modern era when it has to do with uh, legalities and, mm-hmm. and property and zoning and so forth. Do you think um, sort of paradoxically it's possible to be a hermit almost within a city? Or do you think you need uh, that sort of expanse of, be it the desert, nature, whatever it might be? Right. The the, um, the desert model does call for a certain self-sufficiency. And uh, the hermit in the city, though, does exist. Um, Perhaps the, the... would be parallel in terms of uh, individuals working, but not 
uh, not a kind of careerism. They're not attached to it in, in that sense. Um, there are some examples in, in ancient China, but um, I guess they're difficult. Uh, in fact, they would be called hermit in the city, uh, mostly among Taoists who were not uh, there was no religion there, so there was no model other than social life in the city or just quitting the city and going out into the mountains. Why do you think it is? I mean, this is a pretty big question, but even even, even though it's clear that less and less people are interested in it or want to do it, or want to undertake it, which is completely understandable in a way in the world that we live in, why do you think that time and time again as as human race grows and expands that impulse is always found that there's always going to be people who by some natural inclination want to just retreat and be a hermit yeah it is a complex complex topic because you mentioned for example if all hermits are are uh, introverts and in Jung, he distinguishes personality type from psychological type. In the latter, uh, there can be multiple expressions. Um, one of those would be, or all of them would always be related to an object. So uh, somebody who was... Uh, who was interested in, in nature, let's say, the the object of nature would make them an extrovert in the sense of the expansiveness of the object. But at the same time, they might be an introvert in the sense that they want uh, not to have to share or uh, or try to explain that that, that feeling. So they would be off in nature by themselves. So extrovert towards nature, introvert towards uh, other people. Um, that kind of basis of exploring uh, the psychology of, of people might be a guideline to uh, what they would be capable of pursuing or what clarifying how they would want to pursue something like Aramidism or some kind of equivalent. Which is why I say it's it's really solitude. Mm. Uh, it's just not possible to recreate Aramidism in the modern uh, modern urban uh, technological world. It's very hard. Are you a hermit? No, I can't say that. Um, I've always worked. Um, I met my wife in uh, in the university, and that was uh, last December. It was exactly fifty years, and we had two sons, adults now, of course. Um, so I, I'm not. I think uh, my interest in hermits came about because of. Um, Oh, I suppose it was um, job. Uh, you know, work is always can be a source of stress when uh, colleagues or administrators are not uh, ideal, and that made me think a lot about uh, was it a personality issue on my part? Was it a, a structural issue on the part of other? people in charge. I always, even though I spent 40 years as a librarian, I was always observing those kinds of um, relationships and always thinking of, uh, of personality and psychology. And when I came across Bill Porter's book, then I thought, wow, this the whole societies have pursued this in the past. So there must be ways of understanding uh, economic and social relations that are not based on, on um, just labor or class as it is in the Western world. 
modern Western world any. Mm-hmm. Well, I feel we've uh, we've touched on a lot of aspects of uh, hermitism. I mean, is there anything uh, you'd like to add about hermits that you, you feel is key? Um, you're right. I think we've talked a lot about all the major topics. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of the where uh, where I will go as far as um, the kind of reading that will fit this. Well, this. I mean, of course, we have to recommend your own book, which I, oh, was, which I was going to do. But I mean, I would, I would. Uh, as someone who's had an interest, obviously not to to your own level, but someone who has has a personal interest in hermits, I would say this is one of the the best books on hermits I've read. It's clear, concise, and and it's an extremely in depth history, which also you know you people in the West tend to often overlook Eastern hermits. I feel, and and this book emphatically mm-hmm. doesn't do that. So you know, I would of course. You know, I'll say it. I think one of the best places to begin would be your own book. <laughs> You're great. Yeah. Um, when uh, Bill Porter, who I've been mentioning a couple of times, I asked him for a blurb for the book. And he said, um, he wrote something like, um, Aristotle and John Donne were, were wrong. Not everyone is, a, is wants to... Uh, be a social animal. There are some islands among us. And he kind of mentioned the comprehensiveness of the book and he said everything but the floor plans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this is a book, you know, that um, since I'm not really credentialed uh, to write it, <laughs> uh, it's a labor of love, I suppose. Uh, self-published, and you would know all about that as well, I suppose. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and I, I haven't done any marketing, so I, I figured if somebody is interested in hermits, they're going to find the book, and that's fine. I'm not making any any big money out of it or anything of that sort. Mm-hmm. But I would like to continue the hermitary site, uh, continue to monitor the modern... Hermits. I was just reading uh, an article about um, Emma Orbach, who lives in Wales and in what looks like an enormous yurt, uh, and she's completely self-sufficient. Um, she has some goats. She has some uh, gardens. She just and she had an Oxford uh, University uh, degree in Chinese. So I, I have, I suspect that that may have had something to do with it. But looking at individuals, the, the few that there are out there uh, has been an interest. And I'll, I hope to pursue that. But the connection to solitude uh, as psychology, that's another thing that I, I find interesting. That It's not going to have an historical context, so it's going to be that much more challenging to define but that that may be a direction i'd like to pursue well i'll be uh, i'll be sure to put a link for your to your book in the description below and also a link to the the hermitary website um but unless there's anything you'd like to add i feel that's a, a good place to finish up yes it is and uh, thanks very much for for whatever you do <laughs> robert rodriguez yeah thank you thank you